Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Welcome to another great edition of Paranormal Review Radio. My name is Lucy Liebfried. I'm here in Chicago, and my co-host in New York City is Anthony Agate. Say hello, Anthony. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you all out there for tuning in. Yes, we are on Sunday night, not Friday. We thought we'd switch it up a bit and see what day would be easier for our listeners and for us as well. Uh, We may be on Sunday for a bit, so keep checking the Blog Talk Radio site for programming schedules. We've opened up the phone lines. The number to call in is 661-244-9831. We've got a lot of information tonight, so we may not get to the callers. Um, So if we have some time later on in the show, we will definitely pick you up. But if you feel shy tonight and don't feel like being on the air, we do have a chat room open on the Blog Talk Radio site, so let your fingers do the talking. We will also be sharing some links in the chat during the discussions tonight, so look out for that. Lucy, what is on your mind tonight? Um, do you know what, Anthony, where is the most interesting place you've ever gone to investigate? Oh, God, we only have a two-hour show, but um, <laughs> I, we've, been to, we've been to Odesaga Hotel in Cooperstown, New York. Um, that was a great place. Uh, we've been to Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, the Mansfield Reformatory in Ohio. Uh, oh, Stanley Hotel in Denver, Colorado. I mean, two words, Stephen King, the greatest place. Uh, we just recently were at the Downsville Rectory and Church in Ohio. Um, we've been to Bobby Mackey's in Kentucky, actually, a few times. And uh, we've also been to Bachelors Grove Cemetery in Chicago. I mean, it, uh, these places have been so great. Wow, that's quite a list. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I forgot to mention, actually, the most amazing place. There is this place... That has been full of so much activity, amazing EVPs. Um, there have been yes, shadow people. Uh, there have been shadow people. Reports of door closing, um, screams. I mean, screams in the hallways. Uh, Where is I, that, I, Anthony? I, I mean, there have been many photos, uh, uh, and it's actually been featured on both Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures. It's just uh, this Anthony, place amazing. Anthony, where? Oh, hey, it's the subject of tonight's show, Lucy. Don't you pay attention? Rolling Hills Asylum. How could I forget? Yes, tonight's show is all about Rolling Hills Asylum. We are going to talk about its history, the people, the place itself, which is amazing, and the many spirits that roam the hall. We also had the privilege to speak to Ms. Sharon Coyle, Rolling Hills Asylum's current owner. She discussed the history of why she purchased the asylum, and she's going to share some inside personal stories of the spirits that visit her on a daily basis. Now, we're going to play that interview later on. Um, Anthony and I, we had the opportunity to investigate Rolling Hills just a few months ago. We're going to share our own experiences, and there is some amazing video evidence and EVP um, evidence that was captured. Um, It's going to be a great show tonight. So, Sit back, relax, dim the lights, and get ready to hear all about some insane spirits that roam upstate New York's Rolling Hill Asylum. Yes, tonight's show is all about Rolling Hills Asylum. And insane asylums seem to be a breeding ground for paranormal activity. When you think about the horrors experienced by those who once lived there, you may be, may be able to understand why. But Let's go back to before Rolling Hills Asylum became Rolling Hills Asylum. I'm going to take you back to the year 1790, when the land that surrounds Rolling Hills Asylum was created as a carriage house and tavern 
for travelers heading from Batavia, New York to Warsaw, New York. It's, I guess, sort of like a truck stop as it is today. Um, it was a place for men to take a moment to unwind from traveling, have a ba beer, have a drink, uh, you know, get some rest, and then sort of head out on their way. And for about 36 or 46 years, the carriage house served its purpose for travelers, but was then actually sold to Genesee County, New York, in 1836, when the need for poor houses were required by states to house families and citizens who basically could not take care of themselves on their own. Uh, the government requ required this of the states and requ actually created poor farms. And a poor farm is essentially that. It's a working farm that's employed by the poor who were able to work. Um, a year later in 1827, actually, Genesee County Poor House was built and the first inhabitants were registered in house. And, you know, at the time, New York was actually the most populated state in in the nation. And so some sort of order needed to be created with the families and the individual poor that fell onto hard times financially, sort of like actually what we're going through now. Uh, but Genesee County Poor House actually morphed into something sort of like a catch-all for anything that society did not want to deal with. That meant besides the orphan children and the widows who lost their husbands uh, that couldn't earn a living and sort of destitute elderly, elderlies, it also took in the mentally disabled, the physically disabled, and then, I mean, real low-life people that society discarded and even criminals. I mean, can you imagine yourself an able-bodied person who for unforeseen circumstances lost your job or, for that matter, lost your husband and um, now had to be forced to live with the morally corrupt, insane people and criminals. I mean, it, it was almost like you were being sent to punishment but committed nothing wrong. It was unfair and horrible. But at the time, that was the only thing that was actually being offered to the people, and they just accepted it and made the best of it. Uh, the insane were housed there until 1871 when the state actually finally realized that they actually should be sent somewhere else. Uh, but by then, I mean, the insane had been living there, Lucy, for, for on the farm for over 40 years. And by the 1950s, Genesee County Poor Farm was then turned into a nursing home since uh, during the 1950s, the need for poor farms declined, and then caring for the elderly and young handicap actually became much more important. That actually then closed down in 1972 uh, when the patients were actually transferred to a new facility in New York. During the life of of the poor farm and nursing home, state records indicate, and everybody, hold on to your seats, state records indicate that over 1,700 people died on the grounds of Rolling Hills. 1,700 people died. Some of those bodies were even buried on the ground surrounding the asylum, but the grave markers have long been destroyed by the erosion and vandalism, so the graves are not even noticeable. So for 20 years now, the building and grounds were left vacant until 1992, when it was then bought and turned into a mini indoor craft mall called the Carriage Mall. Although the Carriage and Antique Mall was short-lived, the paranormal stories that started to arise during this time seem to grow and, and grow to today. I mean, the place was vacant for 20 years, so you could imagine all of these spirits in that place sort of woke up. And um, it actually became their home, and they, they made it their home. And then, you know, sort of now all of a sudden, in, in, during this time frame, it, 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 they just either were happy or were not happy of the folks that were actually walking into the place. There have actually been several owners of Rolling Hills, including Lori Carlson, who was credited for ne renaming it the Rolling Hills Mall. And then it actually became Rolling Hills Asylum after the mall was closed in 2007. The current owner, Sharon Coyle, purchased the property in 2009, and uh, she's so great. And she's opened its doors to anyone who is sort of paranormally inquisitive or just inquisitive, to say the least. And she has been working so hard to restore and maintain the facility. I mean, Lucy, that place is a hotbed of activity. And it's even said, actually, and we learned this through the tour, that there's actually salt mines um, and Indian, Indian burial grounds that are found nearby. Why don't you, Lucy, why don't you give our listeners sort of an idea of some of the reported hauntings, and if you have any additional history, um, I think that would be great to share with everybody. Sure. Um, well, today there are dozens of stories that are related to Rolling Hills Asylum. Um, they're regarding ghosts and hauntings. Some of these, uh, some claim to have seen people standing inside, they uh, claim to see people staring out of the windows when this building is totally empty. 
Others who have been in the building have heard odd noises coming from the inside, and um, they also report that they hear people crying and wailing. Um, based on the history that you just you just shared with us, oh, my God, I mean, it, it makes sense. Now, there are stories told of ghosts that roam through the building after dark. Those inside have inhabitants. They were registered. They were housed there. Uh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. I just missed my place. <clears throat> they hear, okay, when you're inside, you can hear the sounds of people talking. Um, sometimes people report that they feel a cold hand on their back. Others have seen doors and windows open and close on their own. And I can, I can honestly say that we've seen this with our own eyes. Um, you can hear the sounds of someone or something knocking on walls. Some people have seen objects move, up, move on their own, and others have even seen full-body apparitions. Um, basically, what I want to do is just go over a, a short list of, of some of the things that have happened. Um, let's start with, the, again, the full-body apparitions. They've been seen all around the building. The next thing would be door slamming throughout the building, especially on the third floor. I mean, imagine being in this totally dark place, you're walking through, and then all of a sudden you hear, wham, boom, doors closing. They slam. You will hear disembodied voices. Um, you can hear a woman screaming. It's, there's been reports of a male moaning. You can hear a little girl giggling. Um, you can hear um, recently, Sharon, just, she's going to share with us um, something that she heard just recently. As far as objects moving, People put toys on the floor or even glow sticks. They've reported that they've seen them move. There is a hallway on the second floor, which is called the Hall of Shadows. Shadow people can be seen moving back and forth in these hallways. Furniture moves. There are light anomalies. People report that they have been touched, that their hair has been pulled. Investigators have reported feeling tugging on their clothes, much in the manner that the way a child would, would, would tug at your clothes. And finally, best of all, you get the EVPs. The recordings of voices can be picked up all over this building. Now, the rooms themselves, they do have names. They, they're, they become known um, with certain names. The first one, you know, is basically the um, command center room. It's the country cafe. Basically, when tours come in, this is the room where Sharon will greet you. She goes over all, all of uh, the specifics. Um, there's actually activity in this room. At first, it was thought that maybe it, there was none, but uh, flashlights will turn on and off on command in this room. Now, the second floor hallway, as I said before, it's called the Shadow People Hallway. Now, this is located on the second floor of the East Wing. Some investigators have reported activity between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., but honestly, activity happens all the time. Uh, the shadow people can be seen peeking out of doors, and you can actually see them move across the hallway. Now, in the basement, there's a room called the shock therapy room. Now, this room, you'll hear screaming, there's tapping, there's unexplained noises that happen in this room. Quite a few people have caught EVPs in this room. On the third floor, Nurse Emma's room. Now, this room, men experience several different reactions in this room. Females don't usually get, uh, don't usually feel the reactions. It's usually based on men. And these reactions, they range from nausea, being uncomfortable, to hot flashes. Um, let's go back down to the basement. There's the Christmas room. Now, the Christmas room at one time was fully set up with a Christmas tree and toys and all that. But because of the decay and, and, and the building getting older, it's clear now. But this is the room where the glow sticks and the toys will move when they're placed on the floor. You'll also get activity um, before when it was full with the Christmas tree and everything like that. If people would sit in the room and read, uh, read a storybook to, like you were reading to a child, you would see activity. Um, it still happens when you read a book, even though the room is empty. Again, in the basement, there's the morgue. Now, Sharon recently purchased an embalming table, and she placed it back in the morgue. 
Um, in this room, there are EVPs. You'll hear banging noises. Um, that's pretty much what you'll hear there. The laundry room, again, this is in the basement. There have been reports of flashlights turning on and on by themselves on commands. EVPs have been heard in there, and you will get um, people have reported being touched. The furnace room or the boiler room, again, this is in the basement. Um, reportedly, there are loud banging noises, supposedly from a male spirit that happens to hang around down there. Um, you'll get flashlight activity. You'll also get EVPs. Now, the kitchen and the meat freezers, which are in the basement, there are a lot of unexplained noises that occur on there. Um, some people even report that they've heard the sounds of a kitchen, a, a, an active kitchen, on their EVPs. Um, let's see. Then we have the chapel. The chapel, again, on the first floor, you get a lot of EVPs. Um, you'll hear noises. Um, you'll see little light anomalies around there. The organ room, going back up to the third floor, or this could be called George Fleming's room. Um, you got EVPs, you got flashlight activity. The tunnel. Now, this is a tunnel that's in the basement. It's a long, dark, scary uh, tunnel. You'll get shadows. If you stand there at the end, you take a look down that hallway, you'll see shadows. There's EVPs. Uh, people get a lot of EVPs in this area. The original morgue in the basement, again, loud banging noises. You get EVPs. Uh, the vortex room, let's go up to the second floor. Now, this room is just along the side. It's just like a room, just like everybody else. But in this room, investigators report that they have a very weird feeling. When you walk in the room, um, just talking from my own experience, you get a feeling of dizziness, like the floor is just moving underneath you. Um, it is completely different than any other room on the floor. It doesn't look any different. Um, EVPs are found in there, but basically the whole thing is the feeling. Um, then there's the card playing room, which is in the east wing. Then there's the barber shop down in the basement. Um, and that really kind of summarizes the rooms. Um, Anthony, you know, there are a bunch of spirits. Sharon's going to talk about uh, her relationship with some of these spirits, but these spirits are, are known. They have names. So if you'd allow me, I'd like to go down the list with um, probably some of the more popular ones or the ones that are, are more known. Uh, let's start with Queenie. Queenie, she's found in the laundry room, if you go just past the tunnel. Queenie is an older woman. Um, she seems to look after a child spirit, which is in the building, named Jack. Um, she, Jack is a little boy who moves around the basement. He's very playful, and he does interact a lot with the investigators. The tugging that you feel, that's Jack. Um, Jack, you can hear sometimes in EVPs. Um, I, like, I would like to think that I had a, a nice experience with Jack. But Jack is a playful little kid. He's a very, very, you get a feeling, a very, uh, a very sweet little boy. Uh, let's see then there's probably the most famous uh, or the most well-known spirit of all is going to be Ray. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be Roy. Roy is seen all over the building. I mean, he's seen in the Shadow People hallway. He's seen on the second floor East Wing. Roy is probably the most well-known spirit of all of the ones at the location, and actually he probably is the nicest. He was the son of a prominent banker. Now, at age 12, he was dropped off at the poorhouse because of his physical condition. Roy suffered from gigantism. He grew to be over seven feet tall. He was a very intelligent person. He educated himself while he was at Rolling Hills. He loves music. And there is a particular singer by the name of Ernestine Schaumann Heink that he loves. Roy interacts with investigators quite often. He is reported to love people. There are quite a few amazing photographs of Roy. Um, probably the best known one, the one that was featured on Ghost Adventures, was taken by Sharon Coyle herself. Now, Roy never left Rolling Hills, and he did die there at age 62. Another one of these spirits that you'll come across is Raymond. Now, Raymond, 
uh, he's usually in the basement in the west wing. He usually hangs around the furnace room. He is a middle-aged male, and unfortunately, it was rumored that Raymond had been involved in molesting children. But honestly, there's been no documented evidence that has ever been found. Basically, it he was just a gruff and crabby man. Um, another spirit that you'll come across, Nurse Emmy Altworth. She, her, her room is in the West Wing. It's on the third floor. Um, nurse Emma was a residential nurse that worked in the asylum. She had her own room. She had a reputation of being very stern and very old-fashioned, um, to the point where male investigators have to ask for permission before she can enter her room. This was standard practice back when Emmy was around. Um, unfortunately, again, it has been rumored that Emma participated in satanic rituals within the building, but this isn't the case. She simply was a very stern and proper woman. Uh, another spirit, let's go, let's see, there's George Fleming. Uh, his room is in the West Wing. It's on the third floor, too. Mr. Fleming died in this room. He died in the organ room. It, basically, it's called the organ room, but it, it's George's room. George was a doctor who did work at the asylum. He became ill, and they placed him in one of the rooms, and unfortunately, he died there. Um, you'll get EVPs in his room. Uh, honestly, I'm going to say the poor man is still there. And then another child that shows up is Elizabeth. Now, she's usually in the chapel, and it's the East Wing, and you'll see her with Roy. She's a little girl, and you can hear her giggling. You can actually hear her giggling, giggling um, without EVPs. You, you, sometimes people reported that they've heard her without even uh, just with the naked ear. She's thought to stay near a woman named Rose. Now, Rose is an older woman. She usually stays in the chapel area. Uh, she actually, through EVP, asked for a pair of slippers. So if you go to the chapel, you'll see a pair of slippers on one of the uh, pews. Rose did ask for them, but she and Elizabeth usually stay close together. And two other names, there's Richard and there's Robert. But as you'll hear from Sharon, I mean, there's constantly, there's more and more spirits coming through every single day. I mean, think about it. Anthony, like you said, there's 1,700 people died there. The number of spirits that are in this building is it's got to be unlimited. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, you, you just gave a complete detailed list, um, uh, and I think every paranormal investigator out there is thanking you right now because I don't think anyone has ever gone through the list of rooms and the list of names that you just did. I mean, and, and yeah, that you just only named about maybe ten, nine or ten names that uh, are oh, he's pretty much – I'm sorry? We just touched the surface. Oh yeah, I mean there's we just so touched the more. surface. There, there's um, a lot more, and as Sharon says in her interview, which you'll hear in a little bit, uh, more and more actually keep coming up. And uh, it, there were 1,700 people that died in that place, and so you know you've only got a list of nine or ten. I mean that's a very small percentage. Um, I think what we should do now is go into and play Sharon's uh, the interview that we did with Sharon Coyle. The um, the interview and. Uh, we were so privileged to actually get her on the phone and be able to talk to her for about a half hour and sort of pick her brain as to why she even decided to, to purchase Rolling Hills and why she came here. I mean, she was originally from California. but Actually, before that, she was in New Hampshire, but she moved to California and uh, made a life there. And um, it wasn't until she went on a Darkness Radio event that led her to Rolling Hills and investigate that she just fell in love with the place. And you, you'll hear it through, through the interview. Uh, Sharon is such a great person. She's got such high energy. Um, and, and she's a quick talker, too. She's got very quick wit. She's so great. But she's got a really extensive history uh, herself. Um, she's uh, worked in the film industry. She's also <clears throat> excuse me, worked in the event marketing business. Um, she started two paranormal groups out in California. She's also been the associate producer of the Bruce Brothers movie, The Haunted Boy. Um, I believe she also did a documentary, documentary on, the, on the asylum herself um, or has worked um, in that. But she's also known for her spirit photography that she's done. I mean, it seems as though 
the spirits are attracted to her and allow her to take pictures of them because she's able to um, pull out hundreds of pictures that she's taken of manifestations of shadow people, full detailed people. And like uh, Lucy just said, the one famous picture from Rolling Hills is of Roy, one of the spirits, um, seven feet tall, turning back, walking up the stairs. And you can plainly see it in this picture. So, uh, I mean, it's it's not unlikely that she would sort of be attracted to Rolling Hills and, and continue her life and her venture uh, purchasing and running a haunted location like Rolling Hills Asylum. So I, I'm going to, Lucy, I'm going to play the interview now, if you don't mind. And um, I, I, I think everybody's going to enjoy this interview. So sit back and, and, and listen to the interview that Lucy and I actually did earlier this week. Anthony and I are here. We're talking to Sharon Coyle, the owner and proprietor of Rolling Hills Asylum in East Bethany, New York. Um, before we begin, we'd like to thank Ms. Sharon for taking the time out of her busy schedule to talk to us. Hello and welcome, Cheryl, to Paranormal Review Radio. How are you this evening? Wonderful. Thank you both for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, no. We totally appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, I'd like to start with, you know, for someone who owns a haunted location, you sure do have a bubbly and energetic personality. Do the spirits of Rolling Hills keep you on the go all the time? Um, well, the building keeps me on the go all the time, that's for sure. There's always something going on and always something that needs to be done. So let's go back to when you were living in New Hampshire when you were younger. I read somewhere that you grew up in homes that were haunted. Is that true? Yeah, we always had activity in our houses. One of the uh, the houses I lived in uh, during my teenage years, it was an old uh, colonial, and it was original. Um, the land was an original King's Grant for the area, and uh, there was lots of activity in the house. It was so much so that my aunt, who had come to live with us from Boston, was so disturbed by the activity in her room um, that she packed up and left and went back to Boston. Wow. Oh, wow. So, I mean, there, were, um, there were, like, soldiers sitting on her bed in the middle of the night and all kinds of strange things. So. Really? Yeah. Wow. So then let's go back to when you were living, um, uh, when you moved to California. You started your own paranormal investigation group. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually had two groups. I had a private group, which was called Journey Paranormal Society. And, you know, we did a lot of the home investigations. And then, you know, of course, we did some fun ones because we lived 20 minutes from the Queen Mary. But then I had a, a public group, a meetup group, called Start the Journey, a paranormal meetup group. And it was about 250 members strong. It was the largest one in, in Southern California. Um, actually, on most of the state, it was the, the largest one north of San Diego, south of San Francisco and uh, west of Vegas. It was pretty big. Wow, that's excellent. So what else did you do while you were in California? Anything else that you were doing in particular? You mean as far as paranormal goes or mm -hmm. in general? Yes. Oh, well, like I said, we lived 20 minutes from the Queen Mary. I mean, Linda Vista was 40 minutes away, Wolf Manor. We used to go to the USS Hornet all the time. Um, you know, three or four trips easily up there, uh, down to uh, San Diego, down to the Star of India. Um, I was working with a local theater. It was called the Warner Grand over in San Pedro. No one had ever investigated it before, and I, I approached them, and so my group did a lot of investigations and live webcasts from there. It was a very haunted location. Wow. Um, can you tell us about your spirit photography? Um. It's so funny because I it, it took me a long time for for me to even like label it as something because everyone was so amazed at what I was doing and it's nothing that I'm doing first of all I just some people are are mediums and they're able to see or hear and communicate with, with spirits on a regular basis you know some people have a, a affinity for getting EBTs like the Constantinos and for me I guess I just have this ability I know where to point a camera and that they show themselves to me I don't have any it's nothing that I'm doing. It's not any special camera technique I'm doing. I can get a picture with a cell phone or, you know, a regular camera or a film camera. It really doesn't matter. It just happens to be that they allow me to get a picture. I can't even, I, I don't take any credit for it. It's, 
they're being kind to me. They let me take the picture. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Sharon, Sharon, you actually had a, a, a few awesome pictures. I think uh, the, your most infamous one in spirit photography was in in a closet of a child. I think I heard read somewhere. Oh, it was actually of a man hanging from a noose in a closet. Um, I think that's it, the one you might be referring to. That was in Wolf Manor. And you just used a regular thirty-five millimeter camera for that? Yeah, it's just uh, my Sony CyberShot that I've had for, you know, seven years now. Or so it's an older camera. Yeah, it's just a Sony CyberShot. That's amazing. So I'm sure everybody out there is wondering, how did you come to own Rolling Hills Asylum? Um, a lapse of judgment? I don't know. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Don't get me wrong. It's just it's a lot of work. You know, you just kind of, I don't know. Um, I had come here in 2008 as an attendee on a Darkness Radio event, and and I had like three crazy nights of unbelievable amount of activity. Um, you know, you were talking about my pictures. Usually when I have an opportunity to really investigate a place, I'll take anywhere from three to 500 pictures a night. And, you know, I, know. I, get, I get some really good pictures. I really do. But over the course of the three days, I probably got 70 outstanding photographs of, like, hands manifesting and solid apparitions, such as a boy standing there in front of me and looking solid and blue, wearing his suit coat. And, I mean, just a lot of – it was just over the top. So when Is I that the most that you've ever got, gotten at, a, at a, a, uh, a location? Oh, quality pictures like that, absolutely. I mean, I always got great, you know, really good things and interesting things. But, I mean, that's an exorbitant amount over three days. I mean, really, I mean – not, I'm not talking about orbs or anything. I'm talking about like really, you know, like ectoplasma coming down and, and people, you know, elevated up in the air, three stories up outside of the building and just really crazy, right. unbelievable stuff. And uh, when I went back to California, even though I was really busy with my group, I would always look at the pictures or listen to the EVPs and just review the stuff. It was always on my mind, Rolling Hills. And then in 2009, Stacey Jones called me and so like, you're sitting down, I'm like, yeah, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, she's sick, or God knows what, you know. <laughs> and she goes, well, I got some bad news, and then I got really worried. And then she goes, no, well, we have closing down. I'm like, no, it isn't. No, and I didn't believe her. And we are argued about it for a good five, ten minutes, and then I realized she was serious. And it was like a light switch went off, and I started crying like someone died. And I thought, that's a really screwed up reaction to a building you've been to once. I mean, that's not normal mm. for someone to so emotional right. about something like that. And mm-hmm. so I talked to my husband, and and uh, we decided that I should come out and look at it, and I did. And then he came out, and one thing led to another, and I uh, have a mortgage. <laughs> so that's all I know. <laughs> it was like, it was a poor thing to me. It really was. It really, truly was. And after you purchased Rolling Hills, and up until now, when did you finally feel that the place was something you can call home, or have you not been able to, quote-unquote, call it home? Oh, right away, immediately. I mean, I felt like really? I here right away. Um, I mean, my home that I live in could be a better home. I mean, I live in one room, and it's, <laughs> I, call it, I refer to it as the house of duct tape, but the minute that I go into the building, I feel fantastic. I mean, I feel better in the building than I do in my own home. So the spirits make you feel welcome when you walk into to the actual asylum itself. Oh, I feel that way. It's funny. The first day, the day after I bought it, I went into the building and I had a recorder going. And I was walking through with some friends who were non-paranormal people. They were just friends. And uh, walking through the building, and in about 20 minutes, I had 17 EVPs. And they were really clear. Wow. And one of them included a woman going, she's the owner. Like, all of a sudden, I was really? talking to my friends, and it was like this woman walked up to a crowd of people, and someone said, like, hey, hey, who's she? Who's she? You know, and she goes, she's the owner. So I thought, that's crazy. That's just crazy. Wow. They're when, so when we were, uh, Yeah, I mean, do they interact with you on a regular basis, or are there some days where there's nothing going on at all? Oh, it's funny you should ask that because I, you guys, I haven't talked to you guys in a long time, so you, you're not going to believe what just happened. On Friday the 28th, we did our three-day, uh, three-night Halloween tours, and on the 28th, after we were done with the tours, I was down in the laundry room. That's where we had checked people in. That was like our holding area, 
and one of my other volunteers was down with me, and I was trying to figure out if I had to really lug up all the stupid T-shirts up to the green room or if I could stash them down there, right, because I was too lazy. And I opened up right. one of them. There's, like, these three bathrooms on the back end of the, the laundry room. That don't, they're not functional anymore. So I thought, well, maybe I could stash them in there if it wasn't too dirty. And I opened up the door, and I went, I don't know, I'll have to bring them upstairs. But I wanted to close the door, and the as can be, and Chris, my volunteer, was, like, a good 30 feet away from me at the other side of the room. She heard it, too. You know, our little boy, Jack, this is in the laundry room. He goes, yeah. Ooh, really loud. And I went, <laughs> oh, my God, did you hear that? And she goes, I definitely heard it. It was really loud. It was like he was standing right there. And I got mad at him for a minute, like he was a little boy in front of me. And I went, Jack, you scared me. Why the heck did you do that? And then I realized, oh, my God, it's Halloween. I said, oh, Jack, you got me on Halloween. It was really good. You got me good. But it was just, like, <laughs> hilarious. Oh, so very playful. Oh, my God. It was so loud. It was just like me saying it now. It was crazy. So, yeah, they get me off. When, uh, when, we were, when we were at Rolling Hills Island back in September, and uh, while we were on the tour that you were giving us before the investigation, you I remember this very vividly. You became very emotional while you were talking about the spirits that sort of roamed the halls and roamed roam the rooms um, within Rolling Hills Asylum. Is there a special connection that you feel, or is there some other reason why you feel so emotional about them? I, just, I guess I have a connection to them. I just feel very drawn to them, and I think that they're drawn to me. I don't know what it is. I mean, there's a lot of weird things that have overlapped in my life that have led me here. Everything that I've ever done um, professionally has led me here. I mean, I started out working in the business for a good 10, 15 years um, doing a film production behind the scenes for commercials and television and film. And I'm using this now as a film location. Um, I did nonprofit for March of Dimes the and I way, and it led me into how I, I learned how to do a special event. And then I went into mm -hmm. trade shows, uh, international trade shows, you know, multi-million dollar national trade shows I was looking for. And, uh, you know, that's dealing with attendees and learning how to do marketing and sales all of that has helped me. And one of the trade shows I actually worked for was uh, sustainability and green for manufacturing and companies. So I've learned how to, you know, to do things that you know, can eventually make this a little bit of a great location. But I mean, all of this stuff has led up to being able to use all these skills collectively at Rolling Hills. Um, but it's just very strange. I mean, even on the, on the most simplistic level, um, some of the information I found about some of the previous owners, for instance, Cecil Speakman, I found out after I bought the place that he had a daughter named Sharon born in 1961, and I'm Sharon born in 1961. That's just Wow. Weird. And then both wow. after I opened the carriage museum, and my dad, for, you know, he, he owned a gun shop, uh, literally a sporting goods shop in New Hampshire. And when he retired, he started building horse carriages. And then the Bodeckers had the carriage museum. I mean, it's, right. a bizarre, it's a bizarre overlap of my life with this, with this building. It really is. Somehow it's sort of meant to be almost. I really think so. I mean, I really, really do. I mean, it's just, it's beyond, it's beyond words where I'm here. I have no idea. Um, it, things just keep moving forward, so I must be doing something right, and they're helping me. It's weird stuff. I mean, I don't know if I ever told you this. I'm, I'm babbling on and on. But, I mean, they they actually kind of have my back. Little weird things will happen. Like when I was in the classroom was talking to my cousin one day, and we were just talking about, oh, wouldn't it be nice someday to be able to go to Europe and track our ancestry and, and you know, try to find out where our grandmother was from because she was from Germany and Austria. And I get out to close one of the windows in the, in the classroom, which I've done, oh, a hundred times over the last two years. Stuck right. to the glass is a euro. A euro. Wow. Where the heck that came from, I have no clue. Wow. That's bizarre. It's, it's all these weird things constantly happen in that building for me. So they they must be happy that you are the owner now. I, I hope so. I'd like to think so. I mean, knock on wood, um, they don't, other than Jack hollering boo on Halloween, um, they don't really, <laughs> I, I don't feel afraid of that building. They don't try to scare me. Um you know, I mean, I'm in there quite a bit by myself, 
and going through it at night and during the day and all alone and I mean any given time. I mean you have to remember. I mean there were a lot of mentally unstable people there and criminals and things mm-hmm. and any one of the more negative people could come out and do anything they wanted to me. I'm in there by myself, but it doesn't happen. I mean they never they never you know make a screaming noise you know, or or do anything to frighten me when I'm in there by myself at all ever. And well, I mean it, it, it all boils to down to. It all boils down to practically you save the you save the place and you save them. Well, I think it was just being at the right place at the right time, you know. But right. I don't know. I just I hope that they're appreciative. I mean, I try not to take advantage of them, and I know that sometimes we wear them out with having the tours, and you know. But I think that they're. I think overall they enjoy the company. I really do. Because a lot of these people when we were there, there when we were and they were alive. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I was to say, I think they enjoy the company because I know a lot of these, a lot of the times they didn't have visitors when they were alive, you know, during the poor mm-hmm. right. or they were there by themselves, you know, they lost their homes or, you know, when they were in the hospital during the infirmary years or in the nursing home years, people put their families in nursing homes and never come back to visit them. So I think that they really enjoy the company. I think they're happy to have the company. And I, and you've heard me say it too during the tours that I really discourage um antagonizing them and yeah. and trying to be, you know, trying to do the harsh style of investigating because I don't think it really, I don't think it works um, mm-hmm. necessarily there. I mean, I know there are some places you want to go and you want to be really antagonistic and, and stir up activity in a negative manner. I think some places maybe warrant that, but I think here, I think the people really appreciate the kindness rather than the harshness. When we were there in September, I don't know if you remember this, my brother uh my brother in law and I helped to bring in that old style thirties, forties, huge radio. Did you ever get it to work? It doesn't work downstairs. We have to move it upstairs to a different room. It worked when I picked it up, so I have to move it upstairs. We just have access. Oh, okay. Mm. But you're not gonna believe what we found in the building. You weren't here. Oh my god. Uh, I was cleaning out one of the rooms and piled up underneath a bunch of boxes. And under rat poo and everything else is this extraordinarily large classroom chair that I think was Roy's. Literally, if you're over six feet tall and you sit in it, your feet still don't touch the floor. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Different. Yeah, it's. I think it was Roy's classroom chair when he was a little Aww. boy. Well, when we were there, you know, you uh, during the tour, you were showing us, like, the renovation. So how has that renovation been going since you took over the building? Um, well, we're really not doing too much renovation. We're just trying to arrest the decay. That's mainly the, cause the focus right now is to stop any further damage to the building because there are leaks in the roof and, and things of that sort. So we have volunteers that are helping with that. They're trying to patch some of the roofs and get it, you know, set for winter and, Hopefully in the next year or two I can try to get on the historical register, but in the meantime, um, all we can do is try to arrest the decay and try to stop the water damage that's caused from snow and rain, and that's, that's the big focus. If we can stop water damage, then that's half the best. Right. Well, do you get any kind of local company donations? No, nothing yet. No? Well, no. is there anything that you currently need donations or help with? Um, we, you know, always sweat, you know, sweat equity. I mean, but I have about 16 core volunteers that work with me on a regular basis. And, you know, they got families and lives and jobs, and they give up a lot of time here. And, uh, you know, but there's times where I know that we could use extra, extra guys to help with putting up the plywood and trying to fix the roofs and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. that is pretty much the main focus right now. It's just trying to get that done before winter. There's about four or five really good sized we're trying to get square away before winter. So um, with all the cleaning and moving things around and repairing, um, has it cost any new spirits to, to show up? I know we have the, the the regular ones, but has anybody new appeared recently or in the, in the past few months? It's funny because uh, all the time, actually, um, a lot of the, the investigators that come in, are, you know, over the captives or the, or the quarantine herds, 
they'll come up to me and they'll say, oh, I just talked to so-and-so in the chapel. I just talked to the, this person down in the, you know, in the Christmas tree room. Have you heard of the same before? And I said, no, I haven't, but there were thousands of people here over the course of 180, 84 years. So there are new names cropping up all the time. People are getting more vocal. Mhm, mhm. So with all of these these people that are showing up and all of these spirits that come, can you tell us what's the most endearing ghost story that you've encountered there at Rolling Hills? Well, I mean, I have a fondness for Roy, as everyone probably knows by now. Um, it's not necessarily a ghost story, but he just he he'll crop up and he'll leave me messages and things. Like a, a couple of friends had put a recorder upstairs in one of the closets in the West Wing and left it there for like three or four hours while they were volunteering and helping doing some stuff down on the east side of the building. And then when they went to get it, there was only one voice on the recorder in four hours, and it was one message, and it was just, Sharon lives here. And that was it. It was Roy. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. Closet, yeah. He walked to the closet and said, Sharon lives here, and walked out. And that was it. It was just I mean, little things from Roy always, always put a smile on my face, you know. And then with with uh, Jack saying boo to me the other night, that was like that was like really so cool. I mean, that was probably the coolest yeah. thing ever. I mean, it was just so oh. funny. It was, you know, you saw, you know, it's a little ten year old little boy, you know, like hiding in a closet, yeah. you know, and, and waiting for someone to like, you know, to scare you. Um, it was just it's, it's so typical of a little boy. It was just so cute. No. Well, I know when we were there, we were so amazed and so so in awe of the relationship that you have with with these spirits. Um, but and I know you did say that um, that when you go in there by yourself, that you're not afraid. But have you ever had a frightening experience there? Is there anything that that kind of you know just maybe made you nervous or you know bothered you at all? Well, I mean, there there are times when sometimes the, pl- the place will feel heavy. Um, there's a friend of mine from Massachusetts, Sandy McLeod, and she comes up here every couple of months to make sure I don't go shining. But she's going to be here tomorrow, actually. She's driving up from Massachusetts. Of course, she makes an eight-hour uh, eight hour ride all the time up here to see me. But uh, she and I were up in the East Wing, second floor East Wing one night, and it was just the two of us. And that's been about a year ago, and there was a thunderstorm. It was like in March or, or May, somewhere around that timeline. And uh, it was heavy, and you could just feel them coming around you, you know how that whole east wing sometimes you'll hear and it was coming in and coming in and, and closing in around us and I looked at her and I could her eyes were getting big and I, I neither one of us wanted to say, you know, let's get the hell out of here. But I looked at her and I said, Do you think we should move? And she said, Yeah, I think we should move. Let's move. <laughs> so we went to another part of the building. <laughs> but um but you still feel them. They were just crowding around us. The other night I had a private team in and we were on the second floor of the East Wing and one of the guys went down into the wheelchair down by the exit sign on the far end, almost towards the infirmary. And then he had a friend standing down with him. And normally you'll see, like, a blue ambient light from one of the exit signs coming down from the infirmary and then a pink glow from the ramp from one of the exit lights down there. But with the two people standing there, one, the one guy and the guy in the wheelchair, it was like someone had dropped a black curtain behind him. You could not see anything. It must have been probably eight or ten spirits crowding in that hallway because you couldn't see anything behind them. It was pitch black. Mm. It was crazy. Wow. Crazy. Wow. So um, I know you did say that Roy enjoy. You, you told us on the tour that Roy does enjoy interacting with people. Um, and what you're, what you're telling us now, it sounds like that you've got a lot of spirits coming out. Are there any other spirits in particular? I know there's Jack, but is there anybody else that you can that you know that likes to interact with investigators on a regular basis. Our regular ones. There's a little girl named Elizabeth, and she's another one who's a little devil. She's a cutie. Um, she usually <laughs> hangs out in the chapel, but she does like men, and she will follow men around. I think she probably didn't have a dad. She's about 11 years old. She's got blonde hair, and she tells us taking photographs of her. But uh, I was told about a year ago that um, by a medium that she comes in my house and plays with my dog Tiki. And I try to keep the spirits out. Luckily, knock on wood, I've only had maybe one or two real incidences where I've had somebody in my house. And usually they stay out. Or if they're in here, they keep very quiet, which is what I'm grateful for. But um, I've told that she comes in my house. So I was in the chapel just a couple weeks ago giving a tour, and I mentioned how she goes in my house and plays with Tiki, and she giggles out loud. 
And then I said something else about Kiki, and she giggles even louder out loud. And she did it three times. And, you know, you can just see her. You can picture her. There's this little girl sitting in the corner, you know, now that she caught, you know, she got her hand caught in the cookie jar kind of thing, giggling about how she goes to play play golf Kiki. I mean, that's, I mean, these, they're so endearing. They're like, they're just still people. They're just so endearing. Mm-hmm. You know, so. It's so amazing. <laughs> Sharon, have have you ever encountered any issues with the town of Batavia or East Bethany, or or have they shared any of their feelings towards Rolling Hills? Um, not really. I mean, I think that they're just happy that the place is um, vacant and getting you know riddled with vagrants and and kids trespassing and and causing trouble. Um, they're pretty. Uh, you know, overall, I think they're basically just supportive uh, <clears throat> by way of being passively involved, you know, basically, right. you know, it's like during Halloween, I had to do a walkthrough with them, so, you know, with the fire department, of course, and I wanted to do that anyways, that was, you know, that's, I'm always big on safety, and, but usually they're, they're fine, they don't get involved one way or the other, um, they're happy on paying the taxes, and the place is cleaned up, and, you know, the hotels in Batavia are getting business, and the, the inn down the road in Wyoming is getting business off of this, and, and, uh, you know, I'm buying T-shirts locally and a lot of stuff I order locally and give a lot mm. of people, you know, business locally, so I think they're happy with that. Mm-hmm. And, and you've you've had the TAPS team from Ghost Hunters, the guys from Ghost Adventures and Paranormal Challenge film their episodes at your place. How was that experience? Were you involved in any way? Um, the only ones I, I was involved in was the Ghost Adventures and Paranormal Challenge. Um, Jason and Grant were here in 2005 before I got here. Um, yeah, I mean they interviewed me and and I I knew the guys. Well, I didn't know Jay, I didn't know uh, Zach and those guys until they came here. But Dave Schrader I've known for years and um, other people that have come here for part of conferences like the Ghost Hunters International group were here on a conference and. Um, Bill Murphy from Factor Fake. A lot of these people I've known for years from California. Um, but, yeah, the, the Zach and those guys are really nice. And, you know, I've been involved in the film industry, so it is a, a foreign concept for me. I mean, I understand the film process, so. Mm-hmm. Well, during our tour, it was mentioned that some of the information that was reported on um, one of the shows was wrong. Um, can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us what they reported incorrectly and what's well, the real wasn't their story? Fault. That wasn't their fault at all. That was um, huh. partially my fault because I had taken over the property and they came like only two weeks after I moved here. And there were some of the, the former team members from the old owner that was involved in, in the interviews. And when they interview people, they interview you, interview you by yourself. So like when they interviewed me, I was in the building with them alone. Um, when they interviewed some of the other people, they were in there alone. I wasn't able to be in there and correct anything. And I asked them not to say certain things, only for the fact is I'm a pretty pretty stickler for details. And, for instance, with Raymond down in our boiler room, he's the, the head of the boiler, the furnace room, and he's kind of curmudgeon and he has a reputation about him to be moody and grumpy. And there were some things that people had alleged uh, that he had molested children. The problem is, the historian has no information on this man. There's no last name attached to him. We can't find police records or documentation that would support these accusations. So I w- I really asked them not to say those things on camera, and they did anyways. So mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned, if you can't prove it, you can't say it. So mm-hmm. right. I mean wow. maybe I mean if I mean maybe that one or maybe one person got an EDP that alleged to that or something, but I have no idea. It was before my time. I can't prove it. And even if you get an EVP, I'm still real, a real big stickler. Unless you can get a last name and you can track some sort of a police record or documentation on accusations like that, I don't want to accuse people of that. They're dead. They can't defend right. themselves. Right. So, right. And, and on top of I, it all, you get a lot of children and women in his room with him. So if he was doing these terrible things, why are children going down there and playing in his room? Or what mm-hmm. are going down being down there? So I just I'm very you know, skeptical on some of that stuff. Mhm. Well, you mentioned your background in film. 
Um, are you still involved with the Booth Brothers and their films? Um, I haven't uh, done anything further with them. They're working on some other projects um, right now, but we are in the process, not with the Booth Brothers, but I'm in the process of working with another uh, producer, director, and getting a film coming here, hopefully, um, this winter. I can't say anything more about it right now, but that's, it looks like we might be having another film shot here. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Um, that's awesome. Um, so basically... Where do you see yourself in five years? Would you still be at Rolling Hills? Oh, no. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go anywhere. No, I'm here. I'm here for the long haul, you know. Um, you know, it, it, there's so much work to be done. I mean, this isn't like, you know, it's not like buying a piece of property and you're going to flip it or anything. It's not that kind of deal. I mean, this is an emotional attachment for me. And uh, there's a lot to be done to try to get it so that it will be protected in the long term. I mean, I, I just turned 50 this past week, and, you know, oh, there's a lot, a lot of... Oh, happy man. birthday. I mean, I wish I was 30 and owned this place, because there's so much work to be had, and I'm not getting any younger, and so, I mean, I want to be able to put it up the long term. The property is protected, you know, and being able to go forward and have a long, a long life ahead of it, you know. I don't want anything to happen to it. Well, you, you mentioned earlier that you were trying to get Rolling Hills on the list of the National Historic Register. Is there anything that uh, anybody in the town or outside of the town can help you with to make this happen? Um, I've been talking to the historian, and she has um, some connections to um, the Preservation Society. So hopefully over the winter I'll have a chance to to start working on that. Um, it's kind of a catch-22, though. you kind of got to be careful. Um, I yeah. want to try to do as much repairs as I can now because once it's on the historical register, you have to go by their guidelines. So I'm hoping that if I can get, you know, arrest some of the decay and start, you know, get the things I need to get done first, um, that will protect me in some fashion because otherwise, once you're on the historical register, you have to do things according to the historical guidelines, and that's much more costly. So I'm just trying to get everything done that I need to get done now just to stop the weather damage. And then going forward, is there any uh, is there any stipulation to doing any sort of renova renovation or maintenance on the outside? Because I know that normally you sort of are not supposed to fix or renovate anything on the outside of a uh, nominating historic place. And so I don't know if that has anything to do with in New York. If that's some sort of uh, challenge that you're facing. Um, I'm sure there are some rules and regulations like that, but I mean roofs and things. We're not doing anything to change the the aesthetics of it. It's all being done um, pretty much from the interior, believe it or not. So we should be okay on that. Um, the flat right. roofs were just, uh, you know, the flat roofs were, were patching with sealer and stuff, um, and it's pretty much what's already there. It's very similar to what's right. there. So I don't think it's going to be a problem. So, so I mean, if any I was upcoming windows and stuff, that might be an issue, but I'm not doing that yet. Right. Any upcoming events that our listeners can check out? Anything uh, down the pike in the next few months, during the winter, or maybe in the spring? Um, I have nothing on the calendar yet. I just got through Halloween, which was a big ordeal. We had 40 volunteers there every night, um, you know, doing the Halloween event. So right now I get nothing, unfortunately nothing really major on the schedule, just our normal hunts. Um, I'll probably change in the hours a little bit come January because it's going to get cold, so I'll probably shorten uh, the eight hours down to a six-hour hunt, usually um, from last year's experience, people were really done by 2 o'clock, really frozen. Um, but they were coming out, so I'll probably still be doing something like that. I don't have anything uh, major scheduled yet for conferences or anything, though. It's hard. Western New York is a funny animal. Um, they're not very... They're not very loose with the change. Put it that way. We're doing special <laughs> events. So, I mean, and I'm not trying to be insulting to them. I mean, I understand it's really difficult up here. It's difficult for everyone. But it's not like California. Some of the events that you go in other places, people are more willing to spend money on events. And uh, they're just not willing to drop the dime out here. So you have to be careful. You know, by the time you pay for a speaker to come out and their airfare and hotel and and try to price it affordably for people, then, then there's no money for rolling hills. So. Right. 
Well, I, I can certainly, and Lucy can, can certainly vouch for Rolling Hills Asylum. It is unbelievably the best place I, that I think that we have ever uh, investigated at. And um, I've gone there twice already, and uh, both times have never not been disappointed at all. We've had incredible EVPs. We've had uh, videos, um, uh, uh, night vision shots. It, it, it's just an amazing place. And so I, I want to direct everybody to go to rollinghillsasylum.com and just check out Sharon's website and, you know, buy a ticket or two and, and uh, bring, your, bring your family along for tours and, and uh, go, go out there and investigate because you will not be disappointed. I mean, yeah, I can honestly say, Sharon, I can honestly say it is probably one of the best investigations I've ever been on. I mean, it was, it was amazing. It really was. And you, you are the perfect hostess. You made us feel welcome. Oh. Uh, it was wonderful. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. I have to tell you something really quick if we have a minute. Um, I had sure. a scene on here not too long ago, and uh, towards the end of the evening, and ended up being just most of the volunteers, teenage kids. Um, everyone else had left, so we were staying a little longer. And we were up at the second floor of East Main, looking down towards the infirmary, and we kept seeing all this movement up there, like arms moving and people swaying back and forth. So one of my volunteers and his son decided to go check it out, Dave and Brandon. And they went, uh, or Dave and Dave, I guess it was. They went down the hallway and went up the stairs to the infirmary, and we thought one went left and one went right. And we're hollering, why are you splitting up? Where are you going? And uh, they didn't, they weren't responding, and they weren't responding. And finally they responded, and they said, I said, where are you? And he said, well, we're at the room at the top of the stairs. And I'm like, well, did you go left or right? And he goes, no, 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 we didn't. Well, we were seeing, you know, going left or right crossing the pathway. And then he goes, well, we're going to come back down now. We said, okay. And all of a sudden, Dave comes walking down the stairs. Do 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 do. And we thought he was going to come walking straight across that ramp to the, you know, to come down towards the east wing. And instead, Yui right. goes down the next staircase to go down to the first floor. And I'm like, where the heck is he going? And where is Dave behind him, his son behind him? And then we realized, holy crap, oh, what that man, that was a full-on, dark, like a real, like a solid shadow person. I mean, not just an ambient kind of like, oh, hint of a shadow person. It was almost like there was another person, a human, walking down the stairs. Because next thing we know, here comes Dave and Dave walking down the stairs, and behind him were three other people that weren't there either. But this was the most solid Solid, solid shadow person. Like if, like Anthony, if you were walking down the hallway and, and Lucy and I were sitting down in the east wing by Jack's door and we saw you walk yeah. away, it was that solid. It was wow. Solid. Wow. And, and we were also dumped on and none of us took a picture. I mean, that was... I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> no, we were also dumped on because we thought it was Dave. We thought it was our volunteer. And we're like, where is he going? And then we realized after that, oh, my God, it was just amazing. I mean, I will never forget that in, in all my born days, how solid that was. That's crazy. awesome. That's so great. So, well, thank you so yeah. much, Sharon, for, for calling in and for uh, letting us interview you. Um, uh, Lucy, if you want to take us out. Sharon, I just want to say thank you so much for spending the time to to call us. Um, I would love to, to, to remind our listeners that this is an amazing, amazing place. If you get the chance to go there, please, you need to go there. Um, check out the information. It's www.rollinghillsasylum.com. Um, Sharon, you are the quintessential, you're, you're the perfect hostess. Um, the spirits there are, are, are wonderful. The activity is awesome. And I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your experiences and sharing your time with us. Oh, no, thanks so much for having me on. You guys are great. I had a really good time when you guys were here, too. I really enjoyed it. And and uh, you guys were all really, really sweet. So I hope you come back sometime soon. Oh, we'll definitely come back. We're coming we back. We'll definitely be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sharon. It was good talking to you. Thanks. You, too. Have a great Thanksgiving, man. I'll talk to you guys. You okay, too. You too. You. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was absolutely awesome. Sharon Coyle is probably one of the most delightful people that I think personally me I've had the opportunity to talk to. Um, but you know what? 
now that we've gotten her, the owner's view on it, um, Anthony, can we talk about our personal experiences there? You were there in 2010 before we took our trip this year. So can you tell us a little bit about what you experienced there? Sure. Um, I mean, I can't really top Sharon's experiences, but uh, I can surely say that uh, that I had a uh, an amazing time at that place and came away with a lot of evidence, EVPs and video as well, which I'll get into. But um, I actually went to Rolling Hills in November 2010 with a group that Troy Taylor organized. And if you folks out there don't know who Troy Taylor is, he's the sort of founder of Bump in the Night website. Um, He's an occultist, a supernatural historian. He's got tons and tons of books out there. Um, he's also been on documentaries on the TLC channel, the History Channel, A&E, Discovery, a whole slew of, of channels and, and programs that he's actually done. Um, and he had about 50 people, I would say, that attended this group when I went, um, which is a good amount. I don't think you'd want... Uh, the, the 200 to 300 masses. I mean, yes, it is a huge place. It's a huge facility, but um, you, you really try and want to lessen um, the amount of contamination. And so um, the quarantines, which Sharon calls them on her website, those investigations, I highly recommend them. You and a few other folks go, you know, 10, 15 people and investigate. It, it, it's the best time that you will ever have. And I remember when we went in November, it was a really cold night. It was really cold weather out there. So when I play the audio, you may hear some sniffles in, in the background. So that's not spiritual or that's not ghostly. That's actually me. So uh, make sure you keep that in mind. Um, it was a, I think it was a six or seven hour investigation um, that included the, the tour that, that Sharon gave us. And um, I, I know, th th like you were talking earlier, Lucy, like the Christmas tree room at the time that I went was actually still intact. Um, it's actually no longer there, like you were saying before, because of weather decay. Um, it just didn't hold up any longer. It, uh, but but it, it was a, a, a great room, and I, I surely will miss it and hope that uh, maybe it can be sort of restaged or, or redecorated. Yeah. Since yeah, you Lucy. were in the Christmas room when it was filled, and then again, we went back. It was there. Did it change the way it felt to you? Was there a difference? I, I don't want to admit it, but yes, it, it, there was a difference. Um, I did notice a difference going back when we went in, in just this past September. Um, you know, we've gone to, uh, Lucy and I have gone to a lot of places where um, the rooms have been staged um, either with like the original furniture or sort of similar items from that that period and and it sort of like helps to encourage you as the the investigator to sort of set the mood get your mind uh, back into the 1800s the 1700s the early 1900s whatever the location is and um, it, it sort of gets you in that mindset but it also does help the spiritual activity I think having that original furniture in there or or pieces of work or artwork or, or any kind of um, items in a room that sort of belonged in that era or belonged to that location really does help and so um, uh, but besides not it, it not being there as we went just in September um, I still wasn't disappointed we still walked away with great evidence so um, I missed that Christmas tree room it was so great <laughs> But um, we so we had investigated that room. We we started off actually investigating George Fleming's room, and I had shot to that room right away because of the um, the Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures. Uh, well, actually, at the time when I had seen it, it was in 2005 from Ghost Hunters. But I, I, the memories of seeing that visually of what their evidence was and and sort of so you know YouTube videos and EVPs that I've seen online, I, I really wanted to go to George Fleming's room right away first um, uh, and see if I can sort of conjure up activity. And we used the flashlight and uh, the flashlight method, and that really worked in that room. Um, and uh, let's see, we actually then moved to Nurse Emma's room. And the first time I was there, I, I did not feel anything at all. Um, I wasn't affected by the room at all. Yeah, again, we had sort of that flashlight stuff going on. Um, but uh, that room sort of affected uh, my sister's friend, who uh, I guess afterwards or during the time that we were investigating in Emma's room, 
Nurse Emma's room, that uh, she sort of felt uncomfortable. And uh, basically after that, she stayed in the cafe, which is known in that space as sort of the command center, the home base. And she basically stayed there. Um, but we actually walked away with an EVP from that room that I'm actually going to play right now for you. I may play it twice. So if you can, uh, maybe raise your volume a little bit if you can hear it. Um, we were starting to conduct an EVP session in the room, in Nurse Emma's room, and uh, I had just finished setting up the camera and setting up the flashlight in my recorder that was on the dresser bureau that, in that room, or I think it was a desk, I'm sorry, um, and uh, getting everything, getting ready to go, and basically I have an EVP of someone saying it's her name. So take a listen to this. Wow. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to play it again just one more time. It's actually about yeah. 10 seconds after. I hope you did. Um, so, I mean, Anthony, that was an amazing place. Yeah. You know what? Uh, with, with all what we talked about before in Nurse Emma's room, you know, how men feel uh, reactions in there. Did you or any of the other men on the investigation, did anyone report feeling any act, uh, reaction in Emma's room? No. Uh, um, it was just myself and my brother-in-law that were in, in Nurse Emma's room, and uh, we, we didn't feel anything negative or otherwise. It was just uh, actually my sister's friend who felt it, which I know was kind of odd because normally, as Sharon has explained, uh, men sort of feel things in that room. And it wasn't actually, and, and Lucy's going to get into this later, uh, wasn't until we went on our my second investigation at the place, which was just this past September, that uh, – Yes, myself and uh, my brother-in-law that were in the room, we actually were affected tremendously by it. Um, so, Lucy, you're going to bring that up later. But um, we headed to, after uh, Nurse Herman's room, we headed to the second floor hallway, which is known as the shadow hallway. And um, we wanted to try and capture uh, either video evidence or EVPs, but we didn't get anything that night. Um, and, again, there were sort of, um, folks walking in and out from the tour, uh, not from the tour, I'm sorry, from the group. And uh, so we didn't capture any evidence uh, that we could capture um, in the hallway. We then moved to the basement level and went to the Christmas tree room. And that was where my brother and I actually did an EVP session in the room. And I, I actually, we, we did a session, an EVP session, and I actually learned this trick from, from Mark and Debbie Constantino. And it, it's sort of like a word play game. And I know when I was talking to uh, Debbie Constantino about this, she had mentioned that uh, she's done this before when there are notable children entities in a room. And I, to give you an example, if you say cat, it, you know, if I say cat, you say dog. Cat, and then you wait for a response, and hopefully the response would be dog. Um, that would be an intelligent then EVP or response to it. And I learned that trick from them, and I thought it was great. Um, and if you guys don't know who the Constantinos, go to spiritspeak.com and learn all about them. They, they are a wonderful couple um, that Lucy and I have been privileged to actually do a lot of investigations with. Um, let's Anthony, see, we actually, so yeah. Did you get any responses when you were playing this game? No, no, we didn't. Um, but that's not to say that uh, it's not effective. Um, I wish it was, because that would have been really cool evidence. But uh, but no, we didn't. But I, I've learned that to, from talking again with Mark and Debbie about this, you, you sort of have to get yourself again in that mindset of of talking with the spirits. Don't talk as though you're you're you know, generically interviewing someone uh, in, in the abyss. You know, really picture that person there in front of you. And so if it's a child, uh, try and talk and pose the questions and, and your tone of voice, actually, should be directed as though there is a child in the room. You know, get down on that level. Sit on the floor and try and talk to them. If it's an adult, you know, try and get specific details about the history of that person, if at all possible, 
or you sort of get conjure up some of the history of the place and you relate that to the conversation that you're trying to get or you're trying to to instill and and to to bring out in uh in your EVP sessions. So um no, sadly enough no, we did not get anything from from that uh process, but um we went down to – I'm going to move on a little bit, Lucy. We moved on to investigate the morgue, <laughs> and um, while we were going down the hallway, I, there was some sort of room that sort of stood out to me. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. I, I still to this day don't know how to explain it, but I was sort of – I don't want to say drawn to it, but um, I, I, it just sort of spoke to me in a way that I just wanted to walk in. And it wasn't really – I don't think it was really explained on the, on the tour what it was. And I remember walking into this room, and the room was staged as though it was a child's bedroom. There were um, two single beds – or actually two single beds, and then there was one bed that um, – I think it was broken. I think it was just the frame. There was a mini rocking chair, and I remember seeing a on the left side a uh, bureau or a dresser and a lamp. And um, and on my right side there was another dresser there. And I walked into the room, and it, stupid me, I actually wanted to sit on this rocking chair and looking through the viewfinder, you don't really know whether it's an adult size or a, or a child size chair, and I tried to sit in it, and um, it uh, was not going to hold me, so I quickly got up, um, and I stood in the center of the room and just started to pan my video camera around, and um, as I was turning towards the, the left side of the room, I quickly heard a noise as though something sort of either fell um, towards the right of me, or at that time, I thought I may have sort of stumbled onto something or kicked something that was on the floor. I quickly panned my camera back and, and in that direction and noticed that there was a um, a doll on the floor, and it had a plastic head which was sort of broken, or not broken, but it came out from its neck area, um, and the body of this doll was a soft, cushy doll, uh, cushy feeling with, like, the plastic hands and the plastic feet, and I, I, I didn't know what actually had happened. Um, uh, I didn't see that going into the room, but again, uh, I wasn't fully paying attention. Uh, it wasn't until I actually reviewed the video at that moment that... Uh, on the right side, as you walk into that room, on the right side on that dresser there, there was a pair of uh, pants, I think, that were folded up on top of the dresser, and on top of the dresser was this doll. Um, I don't know how it got on the floor. Um, I can't explain it to this day. I wish my camera was, you know, more towards the right instead of the left. I would have actually gotten the full extent. Um, but I do know nobody else was in that room with me. Uh, nobody was in the doorway or the hallway because as I turned the camera around, um, it actually is an in, in vision shot of the doorway. And we actually had that po that video posted on our Facebook page, which there's a link, I think, in the chat room there. Um, so if you go to our Facebook page for Paranormal Review Radio, you'll see the video of that incident, of my evidence that I actually um, caught. Uh, I, I think it was just – that to me was amazing. That experience I will never forget. Um, it was sort of, I think I can actually say, maybe one of the first sort of poltergeisty type of incidences that ever happened to me. But the funny thing was, until uh, I got home after the investigation and I was listening through my digital recorder, that I also found a, an EVP that came up on my recorder, which happened 10 seconds right before the doll was thrown. And from what I gather from this EVP, it actually, you can hear... I don't know if it's a child's voice or not. Um, it, it's in a whisper tone, but it actually says, hurry, as though it's one spirit talking to another saying, hurry up and throw the doll. Um, so I'm going to play that right now for you. Uh, may, again, I may play it twice, but try and listen in. And again, raise your volume up on your, your laptops or your computers that you have um, or on your cell phones if you're listening on the phone. Okay, I'm going to play it right now. Did you hear it? I'm, I'm going to play it one more time. Uh, that gives me chills wow. every time I play that. Oh, wow, that is loud. That, I mean, that it, is it, it, very loud. 
Yeah, it's it, amazing. It, it, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean that 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 room itself just. Uh, and again, I don't know why I was drawn to it. Um, maybe they wanted to show themselves. They wanted to give me that proof. Um, uh, you know, and I, I thank them for it. Wow! 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 You know what, Anthony, do you know if anyone else has ever, you know, in our research, I didn't come across anything like that, but do you know if anybody else has ever had anything like that happen in that room? No. I mean, not to my knowledge, and if there are paranormal groups out there that um, can share that or or, um, have that evidence, you know, uh, please post it online or, or, or put it on YouTube or something. I I don't know of anyone. I mean, I, I've had instances myself, um, sort of, uh, I can give you an example. So, you know, when I was in the Otisaga Hotel at Cooperstown, New York, when we were investigating that place, um, I was in one of the, the hotel rooms, and we were, again, conducting the EVP session. And at that time, I was actually still new at doing paranormal investigating. And as um, my friends were in the bedroom portion of the hotel room there at the Oda Saga, um, I was moving into the, no, I'm sorry, they were in the living room area, and I was moving towards the bedroom area. And when I got into the bedroom area, all of a sudden I started to feel chills on the back of my, my spine. It actually ran up my spine and across my shoulders. And that's the first time I've ever had that feeling of a presence. And if you if you guys out there ever get that feeling or are able to to have that feeling when investigating, it is just amazing. You 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 feel these chills even though it is not cold outside and there's no windows or anything and you're not even outside. You're in a in a warm hotel room um, to get that cold chill. And then I think it was maybe about 15 20 seconds later after I had felt that chill that uh, something grabbed the camera, the video camera from my hand. Nothing touched my hand. I felt the camera being tugged away. Um, it, 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 that place was amazing. But it, 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 and it, you know, I've had, and Lucy, you know this, I've had experiences that sort of like that at, at Bobby Mackey's. And it just seems as though that they're attracted to me for some reason. I don't know why. You know, as Sharon said, that with her, with her spirit photography, you know, um, she's just able to get these awesome pictures. Not every time, but almost every time. And, uh, you know, they seem to sort of manifest in front of her as though they want her to sort of take their picture. And so I think maybe, you know, the spirits are attracted to me and they want me to sort of experience it and share share the knowledge or, or, or express these things so that they, they, they get the word out. I, I don't know. That, that's just my opinion. But uh, I'm going to get back into my, my investigation. Um, after the, that children's room, quote, unquote, children's room, we actually went to the shock therapy room. And it's a pretty bare room. It's a cold feeling. You know, it's got cinder block walls, which I know that I think there's a history or a story of that in regards to the owner, but I don't have that information with me right now. Um, but the room was staged. It had, you know, sort of like a, a ruster die and bed frame and medical supply chest, and, and I think it was an equipment there for shock therapy in, the, in that room. And we were conducting an EVP session, and it was my sister and my brother-in-law in the room. And um, my brother-in-law actually asked the question, do you want us to leave? And we caught a, uh, a great EVP from that room, which there's an intelligent response that says, okay. Um, I'm going to play that for you now. Do you want us to be here? Did you hear that? I hope you all heard that. Okay. Um, that was an amazing find. Great evidence there. Um, after, uh, you know, all the hours in the place, it felt the, that there was still not enough and that there was even more to investigate. You know, we, we never went to the vortex room or the poker room or the laundry room um, where actually spirits have been noted to, to uh, manifest. Um, but, Lucy, I, I know I want to go back there again. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to... And I know you've had so much fun there, and we've come away with just recently with our September investigation, uh, we've come away with, I mean, amazing stories and evidence. And why don't you, uh, why don't you share some of that with, uh, with our listeners? Sure. You know what? I'm so glad that you decided that you wanted to go back there. I am so happy that I got to go along with you. Um, when we went in September, um, 
for me personally, I have to say this has been, and I've said it once before, this probably has been the most fun, amazing trip I've ever been on. And, Anthony, you know, we've been to – We've been to a bunch of places. I mean, not to knock the other places that we've been, but this place in particular was a lot of fun. I can't wait till we go back there. Um, when we got there, I mean, we went in September. Um, basically what we did, we started out, you know, Sharon met us there. And when you're driving up to this place, you kind of get this feeling. You look at this place, and from what you see on TV and what you see on the shows, you picture this big, giant place. Basically, when you come up to it, it's like this this building. Yes, it's big, but it's it's just amazing. When you drive up to this place and you finally get out and you finally look at it, you're like, oh my god, I'm here. So it's almost Sharon, deceiving from 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 the outside because um, it, it's you know it sort of spreads out diagonal and 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 corners out. And when you pull up to it, it it, it doesn't look very big, but uh, uh, small, I think it's right? what fifty. I mean, 55,000 square feet. This place is huge, mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Sharon comes out. She meets you. Um, she brings you upstairs. Basically what, what she does is that that night we started off in the cafe. Um, Sharon mentioned that there are uh, spirits that hang out in this room. Sometimes she keeps a, she keeps a flashlight on the, the her little counter where she sells her refreshments and, like, you know, souvenirs and stuff. And she keeps a flashlight up there, and she said that, you know, basically they'll turn it on and off. Well, during the night, lo and behold, that flashlight went on and off. Um, we did, she took us on a tour, um, and like you, like you mentioned before, Anthony, it is so amazing to watch this woman. She's so much fun. She's so personable, and the relationship she has with these spirits is just something that you don't realize how deep it is until you get there. So during the tour, she was talking about the spirits and her relationship. She got so emotional. I mean, it's like it's you just feel you just feel so good, you know, when when you're listening to it. Um, she described her relationships with the spirits in the building, um, with the spirits. So she brings us back after the tour. We all split up. We decided, of course, we're going straight to the third floor. We go straight to George Fleming's room. Um, we get in there, we set up and everything. Um, one of the members of our party heard something. She she basically just mentioned, you know, did you hear that? Well, the rest of us didn't hear it. But, Anthony, you were the one that got an EVP um, of, of the man's voice after after she said that. Um, <clears throat> we stayed in the room for a little bit. We decided to go down the hall towards Nurse Emma's room. Um Basically, me, I pick up on feelings everywhere I go. Well, in this, this place in particular, going down the hall, I begin to feel dizzy. I mean, it's like, whoa, the floor just starts moving on me. Um, we get the, we go to Nurse Emma's room, and it's, it, it's all of us. We have males and females in the group. Um, and that's because this is why I asked you before if you felt anything. Um, we did do an AVP session in Nurse Emma's room. Um, we didn't really get anything. We did get the flashlight to go off and on once. And I like to think it's Nurse Emma saying, okay, look, I'll do this for you once, but I'm not going to do it again. That's just the feeling personally I got. Um, both you and your brother-in-law all of a sudden start to begin to feel really warm. I mean, you know, to the fact, uh, to the point where you could physically look at you guys, and we could tell that you guys weren't feeling well. I remember touching, um, I don't know if it was your face or Rocco's face, but you guys were warm. I mean, it was really amazing. Yeah. And the, the the weird thing about it is is that the three of us girls were sitting there, we were freezing. You know how you usually feel when, when you know there's a spirit nearby, you usually feel the cold air. Well, us, the girls, we're feeling the cold, and you guys were just like, oh, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot. Um so yeah, we we were actually we were we were sweating really bad, and at one point, um, I, I I think uh, Rocco as well as I did, uh, I know I did, um, started to feel sick. It just yeah. it, it, it it came over us all of a sudden, um, almost feeling as though um, sort of like the dry heaves, um, but sweating profusely. I remember that room very well. Mm -hmm. The nausea. Well, 
yeah, at this point, they, you know, we started feeling bad for you guys. We were like, okay, you know what, you guys need to leave the room. The girls decided to stay in the room. Um, you walk down the hall. There's a little room that's, like, right down the hall. Um, we didn't really realize it, but you had gone in there, and you started looking around. There's a closet within this room. Um, and then we're, the girls stayed in the room. Your brother-in-law's in the hallway, and then all of a sudden we hear, I think I heard the door, but then all of a sudden I hear you go, whoa. Three of us, we shoot up, we get, we run to the hallway. The door had slammed shut while you were in there. I mean, that had to be, that had to be, that would have scared the crap out of me. I mean, it, it was, it was just weird. We were, yeah, we, we, my brother-in-law and I were actually in the room, and before the full closure of the door, um, we were in that room sort of investigating. I was in the far right corner of the area. There's a closet in there. And um, uh, uh, just, you know, videoing the place and videoing around. And I, I, as I turned around and I noticed the doorway, the, the door actually looked like it had sort of closed, sort of not halfway, but, but in between half and, and, and a quarter of the way. Um, you know, Again, I don't jump to conclusions. Nobody should. You know, it could have been anything. It could have been us moving around or whatever. Um, so we had closed the door. Again, we walked around in the room, and I think Rocco at that point had walked out. I was still in the room, and I noticed that the door again had cl started to close. I didn't see it physically close, but as I turned down, turned back again to look at the door, the door was not up against the wall where I had put it. Um, I'm thinking it could be something, maybe not. Um, so we started to, we decided basically at that point to keep the camera on it. And I stayed in the room and I stayed again in that far back area inside that closet room or that closet area. Um, and I remember there was like rat poo on that shelf there. And um, I had turned around and I was, listen, I was listening to you girls that were in the room, in, in, in nurse's room, and uh, conducting the EVP session. And uh, my uh, my head was down, and I was just listening and listening, and all of a sudden that door closed and slammed. It didn't shut, but it slammed against the door frame. And um, we have that video, actually. Again, it's on our Facebook page. The link is in the chat room there. So if you go to Facebook, you you know just type in Paranormal Review Radio, and you'll get our page if you like it, and then you, you'll be able to actually see the videos on there. Um, and we posted that video earlier today so that you can watch it. Um, it's just, it, it's amazing. And, and it's the viewpoint of uh, my brother-in-law who was in the hallway uh, videotaping the, the actual door closing. But around that same time, Lucy, if you remember, we got a lot of weird yelling that had come mm -hmm. across. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what we caught was a child's voice. I mean, all at around this same time, and after it had closed, we were sort of egging, uh, egging it on again to try and get it to do it on command. Um, of course, it wouldn't do it. Um, but as we were trying to do this, uh, we got, I think, one, two, three EVPs around that time. One of a child's, um, I think and it was in response to you, Lucy, when you said, go ahead and shut that door again. Um, there's a child's voice that says, don't want to. Do you remember that? Mhm. Mm no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna play that that EVP right now. So um, it's about 22 seconds long. So listen, and you'll hear in the midst of sort of all of us talking and egging on to get the door to close again. If you listen to Lucy, she says, uh, "Shut that door again." Right after that, you're gonna hear a child's voice say, "Don't wanna." Close that door now. Right after Lucy says, shut that door, it says, don't want to. I, I, I thought that was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, we have, I'm going to play, the, I'm going to play the other two EVPs of the, uh, the weird yelling and the scream that we got, which was again, right around that time. So I'm going to play the first one here. It's a, it's a quick one. And that was not heard when we were there. That, I'm going to play one more. No, not at all. 
that was not heard or at all um, when we were um, conducting that EVP session. And then I'm going to play another weird yelling one. Um, I, it, I don't know if it's someone in pain or screaming out, but you take a listen and, and, and you try and, and figure out what you think you're hearing. Please, please turn that light on. I'd really like some extra light.
So we were also trying, you were trying to get the male spirit to um, make the banging noise. It was reported that um, Raymond will bang on the wall or he'll bang on the pipes to make this really, really loud noise that you'll hear. So I, I do remember you were standing there, you were trying to get him to, to do that, and unfortunately nothing was happening. I decided to sit on the steps leading down into the room, and I have a pink flashlight that I take with me on every investigation. I put it on the, I turned it on, you know, left it uh, for the, the on-off trick, uh, left it, you know, where it can almost be turned on and off by itself, and I put it on the step next to me. I asked Jack if he wanted to play with my flashlight. No response at first, but eventually. And unfortunately, I, you know, I, I, I can feel things, and a lot of times I, I rely on my, my instincts when I'm, I'm investigating. I definitely felt the presence and the flashlight started going on and off on command. And, in fact, this probably was one of the better experiences I had in this building. I could feel, you know, every time I asked him, he turned it on. Every time I asked him to shut it off, he turned it off. This went on for about, I'm going to say, probably a good maybe three, four minutes. And, in fact, Jack was playing with this flashlight so much when we decided that we had to move to the other room because we only had a certain amount of time. We had to finish up everything in. Jack wasn't going to stop. I mean, he just kept going. He didn't stop until I said, I told him, I said, you know what, I'm going to tell Sharon how good you were and how, how happy you made us. After I had told him that, then all of a sudden he stopped. So, I mean, it's probably one of the more personal experiences I had. I felt so, it just gave me a really nice feeling. Um, from the boiler room, we decided we went into the morgue. Um, we did feel some chills. There is the the uh, uh, the table that Sharon uh, bought and put in there. But we really didn't get anything. We didn't capture anything in that room. Um, I know at one point um, I sat in one of the freezers by myself didn't get anything. I know you and Rocco decided to sit in there. I don't know if you guys heard anything while you were in there. I know I didn't. No. Um, no. And then afterwards, one of the high points of the trip for me uh, was when Anthony, you decided to take a joyride in uh, a wheelchair down one of the tunnels. <laughs> and uh, well, when, when you're in an insane <laughs> asylum, you got to ride the wheelchair. <laughs> I. I do have the recording of that, and, you know, it, it, it's just amazing, but there's nothing paranormal on it. Um, from there, we decided to go back up to the second floor. Um, we really wanted to go to the Hall of Shadows. And to, you have to experience this, this hall. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, it's just a basic, like, like a dormitory-style hall. And there's a set of doors at the end of the hall. They've got two small windows in there where you can actually, like, see. Well, what's reported is that you can see movement in back of the door going back and forth. Well, lo and behold, we did see the movement, but we saw it at the bottom of the door. So we, of course, opened the door. We went out to it's like a sun porch, and we went out there, verified that there's nothing there, verified how far away the road is from, from the building so that we knew that it wasn't like a car coming by and probably the reflection of the headlights. We, we made sure that we... Uh, verified that. Close the door again. We're sitting there. We're deciding um, to try to make contact with Roy. Well, as Sharon has mentioned many times in, in our research, we do know that Roy does enjoy music. So basically one of the things that we did before we got to this place is that we made sure that we had um, a playlist for Roy. So we started playing some of the music. We're asking questions, and we were, you know, trying to make contact with Roy. But unfortunately, we really didn't get a whole lot. I mean, we did visually see the movement underneath the door. And, Anthony, I don't know if you really saw that because you were actually sitting in, at the door facing us, and we were facing you. So we did see the movement, but unfortunately we didn't capture, um, you know, the pictures that we took with, with the night vision camera and stuff like that. I didn't really get anything, but... No, other, th other than, yeah, my, my my back was towards that door uh, facing the far end of the hall, but uh, if you remember when we were in that hallway, we kept hearing taps 
and little mm-hmm. bangs uh, coming from, um, I don't know if it was from all of the rooms, but they were sort of in the vicinity of where we were sitting in that, that hallway. And uh, I mean, that was amazing to me. I mean, there was no wind. I remember this vividly. There was no wind at all that day um, because we verified it when we, we heard those noises and those ticks and those bangs. We, we looked out the window and we saw that the trees were not moving at all. Um, and it was actually a weird night, if you remember. It was, I think, a full moon or almost a full moon. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the skies were clear, so there was no wind. There was nothing, no trees banging against the building or anything. And these were legitimate bangs that were coming, and you heard it inside the room. But, uh, but yeah, we didn't. Ca- we weren't able to capture that, that ghost image behind the door. Yeah. Um, from there, we went to the Christmas room. Um, we did place a glow stick on the floor. Um, I brought a children's book. I read with the read the book, hoping that we can get some some movement. But unfortunately, we didn't. But what we did get was, and I'm hoping that you did post this on the site. Um, you were filming while I was reading that that storybook, and at one point, when I'm done with the story, all of a sudden I hear Anthony say, "Guys, you've got to see this. You've got to see. This. Come on, come on over here." By the time we ran over to you, you had caught uh, a small like. Uh, light anomaly that had deliberate motion, and it was moving. It, it moved in a very deliberate pattern. It wasn't a, an orb or anything like that, and it just kind of came down, and then it moved out of the viewfinder. Um, that was amazing. Um, I'm hoping yeah, I mean, I, like I, don't, I don't believe in orbs. I always discredit them whenever I see them in pictures or videos. Because um, you can always tell that it's either you know moisture from the air or dust particles or or some sort of bug, but it, and this video is posted on again on our Facebook page Paranormal Review Radio, um, and it's a white orb and it's in the corner. I was actually panning the room, and there's uh, the corner area where there are steps that lead up to a doorway, and as I'm panning towards it, I notice that there's this white light, and I move my camera away. And the, the light is still there. So it's actually not a reflection. It was kind of weird from my IR, IR light. Um, it was actually this little white light. And I noticed that it was, it was hovering behind the railing on the steps. And it kept going left to right, left to right. And I'm saying to myself as I'm videoing this, that can't be. You know, it, maybe it's something dangling down. And it's just, again, my, the reflection from my IR light. And then, <clears throat> as you're continuing to read the story to the children in the room, I notice that this white orb light starts to come away from the railing towards my direction. And ever so slowly, it's not fluttering, it's not wisping around like if it was being caught by wind or the air, it's traveling towards me. And you see this on the video, and as it's coming towards me, it's slowing down, and it goes down a little bit, and then up a little bit. And then again, as I, as you were saying, I called you guys over, um, because at that point, I knew this was something. I knew it was not just a bug or a dust, because again, I discredit that all the time. Um, and as soon as you guys started to come over, this thing shot up, straight up to the ceiling so quickly. Uh, I mean, you have to go and check out this video. That, that, that to me, was amazing. And, again, I usually don't um, sort of promote these orbs or these 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 uh, um, particles that you capture and thinking that it's dust. This, I can for sure tell you, was not dust. Wow. You know, like I said, and me, I, I'm I'm on the other end. I'm a proponent of orbs. I believe in them, but, you know, that, that's a whole other show. But... Going from the Christmas room, we did run into the chapel room. We did try to call out to Rose and to Elizabeth. And I think, Anthony, you did get some voices on a recorder because I know I didn't get anything. I didn't get any activity in that room. Um, from there... Yeah, in the chapel we room, I did, I did get... I'm sorry. I did get something in the chapel room, um, but uh, I haven't been able to clean it up. I'm trying to actually get uh, some audio software. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually you can you can sort of sense that the man is talking, but it's in between our conversation that we were having in there. So um, hopefully I'll have that soon, and we can actually hear it in a better tone. Of course, and we're going to share that with our listeners. Um, but from the chapel room, of course, we had to go back to that room where the doll was thrown. We went back to the second floor. We actually went into the room. We took a look at it, and. Um, I remember that we kind of left you in there because it didn't seem like there was anything really happening. So the rest of the team, we kind of 
backed out, and we kind of left you in there. And unfortunately, I don't think you really got anything in that room the second time, did you? No, 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 I yeah. didn't. Yeah, see, the first time was a special time. So um, that's pretty just a brief. <laughs> that's just a brief summary of what we did there. I mean, it has to be one of the most amazing places ever, ever. This has to be one of the best investigations I've ever been on. Um, we spent about eight hours in that building. It wasn't enough for me. Um, I'm sure you do. You feel the same way, Anthony. I want to go back. I can't wait till we go back there. I, I agree, Lucy. Rolling Hills Asylum should be on every paranormal investigator's list of places to visit. It really is a place that just it, it will not disappoint anyone. I mean, I. I I'd like to thank Sharon Coyle again for taking time to talk to us this week and share her stories. She is, and you'll agree with me, Lucy, she is an amazing woman and really makes Rolling Hills Asylum feel like it's more of a home than just a, another haunted location. And if you do plan to make a trip to Rolling Hills to investigate, try and stay, you know, like an extra day or two and ask Sharon if you and your team can help volunteer your time to sort of help repair and fix it up. She can really use some, as she called it, sweat equity or sweat donations. Uh, let me give out the information for Rolling Hills Asylum once again. You have to visit the website, rollinghillsasylum.com, and you can also actually email Sharon at info at rollinghillsasylum.com. Okay, Lucy, it's time to give our listeners a hint to our next show for next Sunday. It's going to be another jam-packed show with lots of information and live chat. We promise you this time. There's going to be live chat with you, the listeners. Uh, our topic next week is going to be all about vampires. We're going to review the history of vampires, famous vampires, the occult in television and movies, which, by the way, the new Twilight movie is opening this week, so it's great timing that we do this show. So mark your calendars or check out our Facebook page at Paranormal Review Radio or on our Block Talk Radio site, Paranormal Review. Thank you, Lucy, for another great show, and thank you all out there in paranormal land. Lucy, take us out. Um, as always, thank you, everybody, for listening to us. Thank you for taking the time. I hope the Sunday night twitch wasn't a big deal. Anthony, thank you again, as always, for everything you do to put this radio show on. Um, I hope that you guys had a good time. I hope that this show has inspired you to take a trip to Rolling Hills. Um, you will not be disappointed Sharon is an amazing, amazing woman, and the place is a fantastic playground. If you're a paranormal investigator, it is a playground. It is absolutely the best. I can't wait till we go back, and I don't know what else to say. Um, so, you know what, guys? Thank you so much for spending time with us on a Sunday night. Um, we will talk to you next week. Okay? Good night. <laughs>